It also <laughs> mentioned that you brought up this Ramada. And a Ramada mm-hmm. similar to a pergola, similar to a gazebo, but there's some difference. Yeah, I, I, I literally, it's so funny. I think about how we interchange words when we, when we don't we even know what we're saying or doing. Or doing. Welcome to Real Siblings, It Ain't Easy, a real estate podcast with the goal to educate, inform, and save their listeners time as they navigate the market and properties in their neighborhoods. Get ready to join real-life siblings and professional real estate advisors, Donna Reed and Eric Seaman, as they discuss how it may be simple, but it ain't always easy. Every time I think about the places I have known, I realize that times have changed. So I'll do what I can to make this house to a home Yeah, yeah Ooh. Hi everyone and welcome to Real Siblings It Ain't Easy A real estate podcast that is altogether unique Unconventional, unusual And seriously, it just ain't typical I'm Eric, she's Donna And we are the Real Siblings We are both professional real estate agents with Keller Williams working in the Southwest states of Arizona and Texas. And for the record, Donna is conversational in multiple languages and I've barely mastered English. This podcast blends lifestyle together with real estate as we work to communicate, educate, connect, and entertain our listeners. While the topics vary and conversations always go, In many directions, we endeavor to provide our listeners with insights into our industry, better equipping them for their next real estate transaction. In numerous previous episodes, if you've been a listener or if you're just new, including episode seven in season one, episodes 25, 29, 30 of season two, we mentioned various Southwest styles such as Santa Fe, Adobe, Hacienda, Spanish Colonial. And if that isn't enough, in episode 27, Donna threw in another curveball and mentioned a Ramada. Well, today, as promised in those episodes, we're going to work to explain and sort things out. So, Donna, since you caused this problem. I, I'm laughing thinking about sorting it out because, you know, I emailed you a copy of what the data entry that we have to put into our multiple listing system when we enter a house. and. We have to choose a style, and I sometimes feel like I'm throwing a dart at a dartboard. You know, like oh, it looks a little this way. It looks oh, you're throwing way. darts, actually. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about dartboards. That's you know another thing, because we don't always know. And the more we research, the more evident it becomes that we don't always know. And so you and I talked a little bit about the fact that that's because styles have blended together, and it becomes an amalgamation of things. So I'm here today with my fake background, which is a Hacienda home here, style home here in Tucson. And Eric's got a lovely black background where he shows up really well. (laughs) I'm I'm glowing. I'm glowing. But I know that I've used the word Hacienda. And in my brain, a Hacienda style home for me always is kind of a U shape with a courtyard of some some sort. And the courtyard that could be uh, in the front and it almost always has a fountain. So again, the picture that y- you can see if you watch this does have a fountain. I've seen swimming pools in the center of Hacienda Homes. I've seen gates all the way across the front. And again, I think I mentioned to you that when I stayed at Ernst and Carolyn's in Fremont, that they actually have a Hacienda style home, which is not common in Fremont, Ohio, right? Yep. Yep. And part of that is that the two hallways or corridors, as you and I uh, talked a little bit about, is that the doors opened off of bedrooms into this center courtyard. And that whether from a living space or from a bedroom, you could go out into that area. So typically they would have tile roofs. They were often adobe covered with stucco. So now homes are frame stucco. They're a wood frame with a stucco finish. But back then they were adobe, which is a dried brick made of, back in the day, made of mud and grass and straw and whatever was laying around. Homes are often, the original haciendas were painted white. And now, like everything in Arizona, we have a whole lot of shades of tan. (laughs) Shades of beige. Shades of beige, yeah. And we talked about 
Adobe versus Slept Block versus Brick in episode four. So okay. Okay. I'm pulling in information from a lot of things we've dropped. Right. In past right. episodes and trying to make it all make sense. And, and again, when we go to enter the data, we have the the construction. And so the Adobe or the slum block or the frame stucco or the solid brick or rastra is this construction. And then we have the style of the home. And it's just, it's amusing to look back and wonder how many I've done correctly or not correctly through the time. These haciendas also had the exposed wood beams in the ceilings and that was kind of a form and function and had some Mediterranean influences. And rough, rough finished, you know, they weren't smooth and sanded and things like that. They were. Did the hacienda, was it, do you, do you know, was it influenced more from the actual indigenous people, Southwest Pueblo, or is the hacienda itself a blend of Mediterranean, Spanish Mediterranean that was brought over and then integrated in with building materials that were local? I, I would say the answer to that is probably yes. I think it was a combination of styles. When you think about in Southern Arizona, the fact that this was part of Mexico and it belonged to different, you know, and everything like that for years and years. And what are the, were the, you know, so people brought their various styles and then yes, used the product that was available. You know, what we have now where we, we have a concrete base and then we put flooring over top of it and all that, none of that existed, right? It was so in bricks. your area, as you look at the picture behind you, and I know you kind of described it to people, the, yep. the posts in the wood, was there enough forestation in that area that that wood would have been local or would they have gone up into the mountains in order to? I'm pretty sure. You know, we have Mount Lemon. That is the single mountain, you know, top where we have tall trees outside of uh, Tucson. So some of that wood would have still had to have been brought in. However, we do have Mesquite and Palo Verde. I don't know that Palo Verde was ever used. And honestly, neither of those were ever originally indigenous here. They were brought from right. other. Well, and you know. Palo Verde doesn't have that much of a trunk structure. Correct. Stuff. They don't get that big. It's multiple branches out of a single right. root system, but multiple branches. Right. And, and mesquite can be so twisty, turny in that, that it looks good. But if you don't get a yeah. old tree that you mm -hmm. can cut down, there's not as much usable material. Now, it worked good for the lintels. Yes. And windows and door frames because right. it's so ridiculously sturdy. Correct. If you're not going to barbecue with it. Right. And originally, again, we talked about the fact that this was Adobe, Adobe, and you and I talked a little bit about the weight of Adobe and thus smaller windows and things. Even if you look at the windows in the upstairs section of this, it's three smaller windows. They're maybe four by four. It's not massive, big, like modern, you know, Right. And some of the pictures you can see of a modern hacienda or a modern Santa Fe will have typical those walls of windows now where you got multiple panels that are eight to 10 foot tall that could slide to open up to that courtyard. Correct. Bring the outside in or the inside out and tie the space all in together. Exactly. Exactly. So that's kind of a little bit of the hacienda. In my brain, when I see a style with a courtyard, with a fountain, that is where my brain always goes. Whether or not the interior is the same, whether or not it's adobe under the stucco, you know, that kind of a thing. And you and I then, we talked a little bit here about territorial, which had the tile, but then you called it Spanish what? Back yeah, you in, in our area, in Texas, they call it a Spanish colonial style. Okay. And very similar to you, what you're having from a hacienda, the Spanish governor's palace, which is one of the most distinctive pieces in San Antonio, has a large open courtyard. There's actually a private courtyard attached to the main courtyard, mm. which then goes outside the walled area. So in this case, you actually went through a secured wall area into the courtyard before you were allowed to enter into the house. And I think... It was the, it's the private residence, which is off of the private courtyard. So since this was the president, the Spanish governor's palace, and he was constantly receiving people in and out, natives, whatever the case may be, there was an area to meet with them separate from the living quarters. But once you get into that wall, a lot of the same features that I've seen researching Santa Fe, it, the, the interior is a stucco with... Mm -hmm. a, a soft, rounded fireplace that's smooth and may have a couple of accent tiles, a stove or a cooking area that's very similar to that. 
Here yeah. we have a lot of the saltillo tile as the flooring. Was that originally dirt? I don't know. And, you know, I've seen articles before where they've talked about, hey, don't think you're going to go into a palace if you go to the Spanish governor's palace. Right. But right. considering what people lived in outside of the palace, the fact that you had a courtyard that could have hold four, five, six houses just for the receiving inside the secured wall area, it was quite an impressive space. Had big ceilings, lots of good material. The fact that it's still standing after a couple hundred years is significant because so right. many of those structures are gone. Right, right. Yeah, there was still the haves and the have-nots. We see that downtown here with the mansions. We see those that were the kind of the railroad barons, and then we have the middle class, and then you have the ones on the alleys, and they were all built around the same time, but certainly some have endured, you know, longer. Well, and I think I mentioned to you the, the contrast of, the, again, the Spanish governor's palace to Depression-era 1930s in San Antonio, where I have seen historic photos of houses that were nothing more than a single room, maybe a 10 by 12, and the walls were cardboard. Wow. There's another one that I've seen where they actually some, at that point, the military had started, by the 1930s, the military had enough of a presence in San Antonio that there's a picture of a house similar to that that has cardboard interior, but the exterior are aircraft container that carried parts into the base that they scavenged and made walls out of. And that was a house in 1939. Wow. So wow. the Spanish governor's palace is really pretty impressive when you when you compare and contrast it to that. And of course, now the picture again behind you, and I know not everybody can see it because we're hoping that you're listening, not just watching, <laughs> but cool if you're watching. Thanks for joining us on the YouTube channel. Yep. It looks like directly behind you, entrance into the courtyard, would that, that two-story section would be, would you consider that to be the main house? Yeah. Yeah, and that is, would be. is it typical in the Hacienda style that the main house is going to be the taller, larger section and then the part that makes the U-shape or just additional wings? Yes, yes. And, and it's interesting because I showed you pictures of the one that my friend Jose is building down in Magdalena in Mexico and how he's got arched ceilings in the kitchen and in some of the main living space. But the other thing that might have happened is that one of the doors to the might have been the entrance to a kitchen. And the kitchen, because of heat and because of the, the fact that we didn't have air conditioning, would have been separated from the living space where most people were. It would have been its whole separate place to come in and nowhere near where everybody was spending all of their time, you know. So now we have great rooms, right? And the kitchen's right there with and, the living and room. And it's here. all tied together and everything flows yeah. because yeah. insulation and everything else has changed so much. Now, so you in talk- the previous episode, you talked about the fact of uh, the scuppers. And is the scupper used on Hacienda and Santa Fe, or is that? Um, it, it could be. So what we can't see in this picture is I'm guessing that the very top part here is flat, in which case they would have a scupper. So the tiles are on the two you know, side pieces we see. The scuppers are used when there are flat roofs. So whenever there is a flat roof, there has to be a way for the water to drain. Typically, the actual ceiling is anywhere from a foot to two feet below what we visually oh. see from the outside. Yes. And that is where the drains have to be because that's where the water hits. <laughs> and you know, those, those walls areas, those are reflective of going back further to that Pueblo style that we consider Correct. the indigenous people making their cliff dwellings because you'd have a house and then yep. because of limited space, you'd put some sort of a staircase up around and there yep. could be another family, another living on top of that flat part. Yep. Yep. So there was that kind of retaining wall separate area. Yep. And then again, on top of that in the, in some of the Pueblos. Yep. Yep. And they, what's interesting is I go back to thinking about my uh, times visiting like Mexico city and things like that and how that people would build the first level, but they would already have the metal in place to support the next level up above so that when the money came and they could do it, they already had the infrastructure in place to start the next level. Now, it, it, super fascinating outside of Mexico City. The Santa Fe would, um, if you picture them and you think about Mesa Verde and places like that, you know, people were walking up and down stairs on the outsides of buildings to get to the next level. So those also were often adobe brick. They may or may not have been covered with a stucco back in the day. They almost always had tile floors and they may have been the, uh, oh my gosh, what's the word? You already talked about it. Mexican 
the tile from Mexico? Saltillo. Saltillo. Thank you. Saltillo tile, which was also dried in the sun. Dry, you know, they would dry it outside like they would have adobe dirt. And that's why sometimes you see dog or cat footprints. Oh, yeah. You'd see the little, there, there's spots where you can find, if, you, if you've got a real authentic one, you can see the bugs. Yeah. That have gotten yes. stomped yeah. into them and then decayed. Yeah. And so now you've just got that little impression that's in there. So yep. some of the other things that I saw, and again, I guess with terminology, the Santa Fe style mm -hmm. versus the Hacienda style. Is the Santa Fe going to be more likely to have those, what are referred to as the Vigas, or what looks like the support for the roof coming out? I think most of the time nowadays, they're probably fake. Or yeah, pro. a lot of them are only on the exterior. That Even my house, my garage has them, and, and they don't and go. And they're basically built into the stucco, and they're two feet long or 18 yeah. inches or something yeah. like that. Yeah, they're, they're definitely- Whereas that originally went all the way through and supported the roof. Correct. Right, Yeah. and then another one, and there's an example in San Antonio, aside from the Spanish governor's palace, you gotta go back to the San Antonio missions, which were built during the Spanish colonial era, right. and directly adjacent to our most famous mission in San Antonio, the Alamo, is a reconstruction restoration of what they refer to as the long barracks. And the long mm -hmm. barracks have some of those hacienda style, but it's still considered in our area Spanish colonial. It's got archways. Yeah. Which honestly, those arches were introduced at one of the other missions in San Antonio called Mission Espada. But then adjacent to that, there's the covered walkway area right outside of the barracks. So there was some shade outside where you could get breeze without mm -hmm. having to be inside. And that's where they came up with the uh, corridors here in San Antonio in the Spanish colonial. And then up above, before whatever roof material was on there, they put in what they referred to as uh, the latias. And those were thinner pieces of wood. Common in San Antonio is what we refer to as a mountain cedar or mesquite. They stripped it from the bark and they put it in some sort of ornamental pattern. So if you looked up, it actually was kind of, it's like, wow, how much time did it take to do that? And it's like, we weren't thinking really about the aesthetics. We were trying to make it functional and provide shade. Yeah. You know, Eric, talking about you and I both live in places where, especially you, I think about some of the homes where the, with the German influence. So when you see the combination of the colored fancy trim work in what would be a Southern, Southwestern home, it's such a blend of what people brought with them and then added to the materials and the styles that were available and, and that then were created. Saying that is a reference to that style that you found, the folk Spanish? Yeah, yeah, uh, a folk territorial or whatever. A folk territorial would be similar to what people yeah. saw, especially if they watched the movie Tombstone, since it was shot there on location. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Good examples of that type of structure left. Yeah. And I'm going up to Rancho de los Caballeros uh, tomorrow. If you recall, they had a lot of that. They had a lot of that. German yeah. kind of flowery in and and stuff combined with the the ranch, the Southwest Ranch. So, kind, just kind of interesting to see how everybody brought their influences. You know. All right. So hopefully we've cleared something up as we've talked about. <laughs> we also mentioned that you brought up this ramada and a ramada mm -hmm. similar to a pergola, similar to a gazebo, but there's some difference. Yeah. I, I I literally it's so funny. I think about how we interchange words when we when we don't we even know what we're saying or doing. Or, so a pergola to me, and I looked this up um a little while ago, is often it was like a shaded pathway or something, and it was just wood slats or something, it'd be a little bit of a shade, but it had cross beams and patterns and it allowed air and stuff to come through. And it's now I'm going to call the plainness of it um, goes with a lot of modern preferences. They want, you know, the kind of slaps yes. and the ge geometry. And, and I think, honestly, I never knew had heard the term pergola until HGTV or DIY. And a lot of gardens and lawns. It's got to have, oh, look, it's got a pergola. Yeah. Yeah. And so then a ramada is typically square. This makes me laugh. So and it's got a solid cover. You know, if you put a Ramada in your yard, it's probably square and it's going to be totally shielding you from the sun and the rain. And often that's what's going to be put over an outdoor kitchen or something like that. They're going to make sure that it's totally uncovered. It's covered and you're not going to have wood slats. So it's not going to be raining and blowing all the 
dust and stuff and, like and that. And honestly, so, when you said that in that episode, all I heard and all I thought was, wasn't there a hotel chain called Ramada? Yeah, there was. And I just <laughs> thought it was a catchy name. I didn't know it was something to do with. And it may not have been. Who knows? Cover in protection from the elements in the sun. And then gazebos are typically covered all the way. But so when I think of a gazebo, I often think of musicians in a park and they're typically like a hexagon or something like that. They're not square. They're going to be circular or octagonal or something like that. Yeah. Can't you picture like musicians on a stage in a park playing in a gazebo, but not in a ramada or a pergola? (laughs) And if those musicians were in Tucson area, are they going to be mariachis or are they going to be some other type of musical group they could have either or one of the restaurants here is in, here in towns has a uh, gazebo and tons of people take their pictures you know there for graduation and thing is and they might they might have more of the carved milled look on the outside and stuff like that as compared to the rough hewn wood of days past you know it's funny to think that, again, we use all those words. Makes me want to go through the multiple listing system and see who has said what about what. <laughs> yeah, well, and I've had people specifically look and ask me before for something of that style. And there are really so few what would be Santa Fe or Hacienda style built. Uh, ah. Far more common with especially the newer builds is to list it as a Mediterranean style. Yeah. And a Mediterranean is going to carry a lot of those same features. There's going to be a lot of stucco. There's going to be tile. Not typically is that going to be a composition shingle or something along those lines. Not going to be a metal roof. It may have some limestone accent here, but it's more about, I think the Mediterranean has a freer style and it isn't con- as conformed as something that we might refer to as a contemporary if so that are makes you- any sense. And of course, money plays into it a lot. You can have a multi-million dollar contemporary house that looks very, very different from a median price $320,000 contemporary house. And so do you guys have, we talked about this a little bit, we have contemporary and modern. Well, And I that- don't think people understand mid-century modern well enough no, no, to no. say, no, this no. is the modern, this is a ranch. Now, one of the styles that we do have distinctively here is what they consider hill country. Oh. And hill country is going to have that broader porch that's covered. It's going to be generally a lower profile oh. because they stayed lower to the ground. It was out in the country. Heating and cooling and that sort of thing were all based on cubic feet. So okay. you could keep a lower roof line with more shade across the windows, preventing letting light but not direct sunlight in, creating that heat source, and then yeah. lots of limestone used. And that's really where originally it would have had a cedar or a wood shingle, and that became a metal shingle. So, all right, I got someone who's going to be coming in. We got to wrap this thing up because <laughs> you're going to yield my space that I'm in. <laughs> all right. So, As we close the episode, we want to thank you for joining us and our stroll down memory lane, which we hope also then you might have some memories of our earlier episodes. And we (laughs) reflect a little bit, not so much about Lindsay, Ohio today, but a little bit more about the homes and the styles of where we live and work right now. So we try to make this a blend of lifestyle and homes and real estate. And as we conclude, we want you to keep in mind that our goal is to communicate and educate and entertain and connect with you. So hopefully we're connecting. (laughs) If you're in Arizona and specifically I'm in the Tucson area with Keller Williams and Eric is in South Central Texas in the San Antonio area, we are here to help you and help you find the perfect property for you to call home. And reminder that we both have a network all across the United States and pretty much around the world of real estate professionals. Global or global 55 countries i looked yesterday air 55 countries kw is in real estate advisors we're happy to connect with you and put you together with another amazing realtor so we'd like you to remember that it may be simple but it ain't always easy and until next time i'm donna and i'm eric and we are real Real siblings siblings. (laughs) we work Uh work way too hard we work way too hard at that you're right thanks all time I think about the places I have known I realize
realize that times have changed So I'll do what I can to make this house into a home and I want to thank you for investing your valuable time in listening to Real Sibling. It ain't easy. I hope you found this episode informative and enjoyable. There are several ways you can support this podcast with my grandpa Eric and Aunt Grandma. Please take the time to like, follow, and subscribe. Additionally, leave them a five-star rating along with a review on your preferred podcast platform. The final thing I would ask is that you recommend this podcast to a friend, a family member, or an associate. Your engagement is critical to their ongoing success, and they look forward to connecting. Check out the show notes Grandpa put together with their contact information, including emails, phone numbers, and websites. And remember, the real siblings look forward to hearing from you.